Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ahmed Mirsessian, Director of the Center. Uh, welcome to the meeting today on the completeness of physics. Uh, the participants today are Joseph Cohn, who is Professor Emeritus of Mathematics from Princeton University, uh, Tim Maudlin, who is Professor of Philosophy at New York University, Priyam Vadan Natarayan, who is Professor of Astronomy and Physics at Yale University, Jonathan Kramnik, Professor Maynard Mack, Professor of English also at Yale, and Cal Rovain, Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. Uh, we have one more meeting scheduled this year. It will be in June, and it's a combination of science and uh, art, and it's on turbulence. And there will be an art show uh, during that week, and the meeting, on, unlike our usual meetings, will not be on a Saturday, but on a Thursday night. I think it's June, the second Thursday, or the first Thursday. You'll, you can uh, find it on the website. That, that's it? That's it. <laughs> Uh, what, why is everybody we looking at me? <laughs> what, are we, what are we supposed to be talking about? Um, <laughs> the completeness of physics? I'm sorry, I can't remember the title. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the implications of the, well, you know, of the, completion, the completeness of physics. Okay. Perhaps you could... Right, perhaps, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll start, start then. I, I will start. Um, just to give... So, so there's a, a, a kind of sense in the science community that the physicists are a little bit uppity um, and, and a yeah, just a little, and feel like they occupy some higher position in virtue of their subject matter than the other scientists. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some manner of, of hostility around that. It's certainly true that the physicists have been able just as a matter of fact, to be incredibly successful at making quite precise predictions for certain experiments and testing them to many degrees, many, many decimal places, and having them come out right in a way that uh, the biologists or the economists or the chemists even never will. You give them as long as you want. There will never be a biological thesis that gives rise to a prediction to 14 decimal places and check to that accuracy. Um, and so there's this, this sort of ambient sense that physics holds a, a, a primary, in some sense a primary or foundational uh, role among the sciences and, and, and at the height of arrogance uh, a physicist might say, well, all of chemistry, that's really physics, just done a little sloppily. And uh, all of biology, that's really chemistry, just done even more sloppily. And uh, so on up the scale. Um, and, and that uh, for a, 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 a perfectly trained mind, everything would be clear if it was reduced to physics. Um, and I guess I, I guess I can start at least with a comment about, about that, which is that there's something to it, but not anything like what I just said. Um, and the something to it is that um, physics alone of the sciences has programmatically the requirement to cover everything in a certain sense, within its own scope, within its own vocabulary, and within its own concepts. So to give an example of the way the other sciences don't have this, um, think of medicine. You go to your doctor and he examines you and he pronounces um, you're going to live another 40 years. And very happily you walk out of the doctor's office uh, across the street, get hit by a bus and are killed. 
And if you go to the doctor and say, that was a pretty bad prediction, um, the doctor quite rightly will say, that's not my department. <laughs> um, my medical prognosis didn't cover collisions with buses. <laughs> that's out of my field. Uh, and the difference is that the physicist can never say that. Um, every medical event is a physical event. Every economic event is a physical event. Every biological event is also a physical event. Every astronomical event is also a physical event. Everything that happens in principle ought to be covered by physics using its own vocabulary and using its own set of concepts. And it's never appropriate for a physicist to say, that's not my department. And the demand also for complete precision and accuracy is unique to physics. Having said that, uh, it's just false that the other sciences reduce to physics or are nothing but physics. The other sciences use their own conceptual systems, their own vocabularies, their own explanatory structures, and give insight and understanding into events that you'll never get study the physics as much as you want. Um, you know, if you want to understand what Joyce was doing when he wrote Finnegan's Wake, we were just having a discussion about this, um, a complete physical description down to the last detail of his brain will not help you study it as much as you want. Um, so there's an interesting question of how the sciences relate to each other and how different forms of understanding and comprehension relate to each other and how independent the sciences, the special sciences, can become of the physical basis, which I don't think there's a general answer to. I think before we move on to looking at the relationship between other sciences, it is worthwhile pointing out you know, how physics has achieved the kind of successes that it has, and sort of looking perhaps at what the metaphysical, epistemological suppositions that were needed to understand sort of this success. And this notion of being able to order phenomena, to uh, formulate laws. And I think that's sort of one um, particular intellectual claim that physics would make, right? That, uh, that there's something uh, deep about the nature of reality and the order of the physical world that physicists, in combination with mathematics, have just found the right vocabulary to distill. Well, uh, I, may, uh, I would say, that um, in this pecking order, if you're going to have a pecking order, <laughs> mathematics obviously goes on top of what <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 well, We can do that one out. Right. <laughs> Just you have to do, Just not, not only you can do, you have to do some mathematics. <laughs> Well, that's the point. Uh, so do you. I, 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 just, I just taught philosophy of science, and uh, the first day of class, I said, how do we divide? We have the arts and sciences. Where does everybody go? Yeah. And of course, mathematics was just off by itself. Self. Because it doesn't, it's not empirical. It doesn't have laboratories. It, it doesn't fit with any of the other sciences, although in some sense it's a science. Okay, so, so it's an interesting let me, question. Let me just say this. That, um, I want to have a weird quote from a physicist. And I think, but I think it's some, something funny. Uh, Niels Bohr said that there are two kinds of truths. There are the small truths and the great truths. Small truths have the property that the opposite of a small truth is false. But the great truths have the property that the opposite of a great truth is also true. <laughs> so, so the, I mean, this is nonsense, of course, in some ways. But in some ways, there's something to it. And I want to say, uh, I want to say that what's uh, what's in there is that 
I don't view, I mean, there's a kind of division about physics and biology and, and so on. People say this is, uh, disciplines are divided. And inside a discipline, there is cosmology and there's solid state physics, and I don't know what. But um, I, I just want to look at the general picture. Uh, the general picture, how do people, what science? What do, what do people understand as science? So uh, science seems to me is uh, taking something that's demonstrably false, a model. Like in the early, in the early days, science was uh, mostly plotting, uh, figuring out how, how large plots are and doing architecture and so on. It was sort of science. And so you, st you start drawing lines on paper and you say that that represents something real. Well, there's no such thing. I mean, you, uh, a point is not, it's an abstraction. I mean, point, if you look at closely, but what is a point? It's some kind of thing, uh, uh, quarks or something. I, I don't know. You, you know, it's, so you, have to, you start out with something that's what, what people call a toy model or a model. And you say, okay, uh, now we have this beautiful thing called, called plane geometry that seems to describe our world. We can design buildings, you can design pyramids, you can design cities using plane geometry. Well, it turns out that if you try to design uh, routes for airplanes, the plane geometry doesn't work. You have to use spherical geometry. And then you say, okay, so that's part of uh, our geometrical <laughs> world. You have spheres and you know how to draw triangles on spheres and you have a spherical geometry. Okay, but then after a while you find out that, that that doesn't work either, and you, you have uh, Riemannian geometry, you have Lorentzian geometry, and so on. So um, it seems to me that all of science consists of having some kind of model, which is usually a mathematical model or something, and you know damn well that that's not the thing. It's a model. And um, and then you make logical deductions from that. And lo and behold, you find new phenomena, and you look at the world and find that they, they work. Uh, maybe I'll give an example or two of that. But anyway. Uh, but the point is that these idealized models, right, um, they're very powerful. They're very at powerful. Least extremely they're very powerful. powerful. And they come in very strange ways. For example, uh, you know, mathematicians had been for centuries trying to find formulas to solve equations. The famous e quadratic equation you know, for formula you learned in high school, it was a great achievement. And then they, then they worked very hard and actually found a solution of a cubic equation you know, and, and a fifth degree equation. And it was so sort of mysterious, what happens? And then group theory was discovered. And they find, found that certain they found exactly what kind of formulas can be used for what equations from group theory, from what's called Galois theory. And they developed a certain theory of groups, which means really symmetries uh, of the roots of the polynomial. Anyway, it's, it's a kind of a symmetry thing, uh, groups. Okay, We're so, coming back to order, right? We're coming uh, order. back to order. And so then came uh, really one of the great mathematicians of all times, Emmy Nether, who noticed that the conservation laws of physics have to do, the, the symmetry, conservation laws of physics have to do with symmetries of space, of a certain group. And a certain group, which mathematicians call SO3, never mind, but anyway, a certain group, uh, an analysis of that predicts the conservation laws of classical physics. And then using the same idea, using other groups, there were Hermann Weyl and Eugene Wigner and others, developed a way of studying uh, particle physics using those groups, as, uh, these ideas of group theory. And they could do remarkable things. They could predict, predict quarks, predict new particles, just from st uh, the study of group theory. So um, it's a kind of a back and forth business. It's uh, uh, ideas, uh, sometimes originating in mathematics, sometimes originating in physics, sometimes originating somewhere else are then abstracted into some kind of model and you work with that and use mathematical methods and find certain
consequences. And then you go and check in the real world if those consequences work. And if they do, then you have an explanation. But then, uh, then uh, somewhat later, you may have, uh, you may find out that the kind of thing explains lots of stuff, that theory, right? But at a certain point, it doesn't explain something. So you have to then modify the whole works and start a new theory. And so you don't... Well, the goal uh, is to explain everything. The goal is to explain everything, but step by step. No, no, you I don't understand. explain everything in one, one blow. So the goal, if I understood you, if the goal is to explain everything, you were saying it's not possible. I, I, the, the goal of physics is to account for all physical phenomena, which includes all empirical phenomena. Well, excuse me, but, those, those, that, is a, that is not all, what does all mean? That all is a function of well, time. Well, reality, I of, mean, all uh, of reality. No, no but it's a function of time. Reality. It's a function of time. If you, oh. once I discover a new electron microscope or something, I'll find new, or a new, a new uh, cyclotron or, or more powerful cyclotron, I may discover new things. And, so, and then all would have to include that. And the previous theory that explained everything before right, that the, may not explain that one. But the reality exists whether or not, whether you have an electron microscope when you are able to see viruses or not, viruses exist. Yes. Right? I mean, they're You're, part but, of reality. But somebody has to discover them before you uh, say they exist. Yeah. Can I take us in a slightly different direction, though, yeah. to follow up on, uh, Tim, um, the two points that you were making that seem to be in a kind of interesting tension with each other. On the one hand, that the goal of physics is to provide an account for everything, all of reality, all of physical reality. At the same time, there's much that physics can't explain that mm -hmm. lies outside of physics. It seems like you're committed, and I am too, to, I mean, to the degree to which I understand the propositions. I think I'm also committed to each one of those things. Um, but it also seems to me that there is an interesting tension between the two. And perhaps we could just sort of spell that out a bit, because I think that lies at the heart of what it is that you know, animates this question. Yeah, can I, can I give a really simple example? Sure. I don't wanna, I, one thing I don't want it to do is sound mystical. So let me <laughs> demystify it as much as possible. Um, uh, I have an object in front of me on the desk, and there is a pattern of light coming right. at me from it. And I say to the physicist, quay physicist, um, can you please predict what's going to happen with this pattern? And they take the object and they subject it to complete physical analysis, and they say, all right, what you have is a, a spectrum of light um, that's shifting in a certain patterned way. Uh, uh, from our analysis, it will continue doing this for exactly 2.83 years and then stop. Good. And I can't describe to you how difficult what I'm saying would be to do. That is, you, you, you take this thing and you have to analyze it down to the level of electrons and solve impossible equations. So I'm giving the physicist all kinds of powers he doesn't have, but that in principle physics could do. Uh, and then I, I, I uh, ask the computer scientist to come into the office, and he walks in front of the same object. Uh, he doesn't even look at it. He glances at it and looks at the sheets of paper that are sitting next to it. And uh, he says, he, what, what you're seeing is this little spinning uh, disk of death that comes up on your computer, right? When it's just thinking. And he just glances down at the papers and says, you idiot, uh, step 12 in your program is go to step 18, and step 18 is to go to step 12. You've built a loop into your program, and that little guy is going to spin forever. That is, your program will never stop. Now, he makes a prediction, too. He says that this little light will go on forever. He's wrong. It's actually going to go off in 2.83 years when certain circuits burn out of the computer, which the physicist is fine with, right? Um, but the computer scientist has given me a heck of a lot more insight or understanding or comprehension of what's going on than the physicist has. Um, and, he never, and this has exactly to do with building a model. The computer scientist has an abstract model of the computer and of the programming 
that he says, I don't care how you realize this thing in physics, right? I don't care what kind of chips you're using. I don't care what kind of elements there are. As long as what you've realized is described well by this abstract model, I can tell you what it's going to do. Uh, and so this is, again, this is the, the example of bringing, so there's no tension between them, right? No, I, I think I understand this better now. So in a sense, so in zooming out even further, if you imagine this as being like a still life painting, um, using your example from the arts from earlier, mm -hmm. Um, so this is still life painting of a table with a bottle on it. You can give a physical account of it insofar as you're describing you know, the properties of light in the way right. that you just did. But that account, so it lies within physics in that sense, but that account probably will not tell you very much about the painting itself. Exactly. Um, uh, or the, making predictions yeah. for the future of that object. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's a description that's valid yeah. for a moment of time. Sure. Snapshot. Right? Yeah. And in terms of our understanding, is valid in, if you were interested in the questions that it answers, I suppose, but doesn't go very far to answer the question, well, tell me about this painting, tell me, what, tell me about its aesthetic properties, tell me about its historical meaning, or, and so or, on. Right, or even, even let's go to prediction. You, right. you, you've taken the painting into Sotheby's, mm -hmm. right. and you say, I would like a prediction for how much someone's going to be willing to pay for this object. Sure. Um, next week. <laughs> the physicist is not going to have a chance at that, right? right? No right. way. Right. And this right. person may Wait, very well right. be able to look at it and say, yeah, this right. looks like an authentic, you know, and I know yeah. the market uh, and I know what people I mean, are thinking uh, and here's my prediction so, for how much it's going to go for. So then maybe no, but, the, uh, sorry, let me just say, I don't get this line of uh, argumentation. Are we talking about, I mean, this program says we're talking about possibilities of the future. I say today, the physicist has nothing to say about anything. That physicist can't say anything about Joyce or uh, something like that. But we're talking about future of mankind, right? Sure. I mean, physics and science has existed for a few hundred years, but uh, and it's developed enormously. And I don't think you can limit just by saying because you don't understand what a physicist can do today, you can't say that physics or science can't do it, can do something in the future. You don't know what it'll be able to do. You don't know what you don't know uh, what kind of understanding of the market forces there will be, so that uh, so that you can really predict. I think by, he was just uh, being concessive for the sake of argument about. No, I was saying no, everything I said was perfectly uh, uh, sincere. And sincere. I, I, I'm not not being concessive about anything. <laughs> about you mean you don't think you're being concessive when you say that. Um, there are lots of purposes and explanatory uh, enterprises that we uh, pursue, which look right now as though they give us information that it would be hard to get just doing physics. Right? I think that physics yeah. will never give us that information. Right. Well, ever, I think ever, that ever, we ever. should well, just be yeah. open. You know, it's odd, so I want to jump in here. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting how much certitude there is in these discussions, rather than agnosticism. Uh, okay, so, so, so uh, okay. That. And... Um, and the, the, the very idea of the completeness of physics is ambiguous between a lot of things, and that's why the conversation had a hard time getting going. And I've heard a number of different things already come up. You made clear you don't think it is um, the case that every truth we might want to know would be a truth that counts as a truth of physical theory, right? Because we might have other, other enterprises. That's one way in which you could think about an incompleteness of physics. And then you say, oh, well, but it turns out it's complete because there's no event that takes place that doesn't come within the purview of, the, of sort of the question, how did it happen, where the answer would get a physical explanation. So that's another notion of completeness, which looks ontological almost. Then you have fundamental order. That's your notion. And so there's some notion of fundamentality there. OK. So my colleague David Albert says things like, you know, what if we've discovered all the fundamental particles and all the fundamental laws that govern the fundamental particles, then that's everything. Now, but what notion of everything is it? You've already, so I think there's a concession about um, how, if you know that, there's much you still don't know, right? Literally don't know if uh, the descriptions of James's work or uh, the truth about a program that's about possibilities and not physical no, facts. What you don't know and so is at that point, once you know all the fundamental forces, you know all the fundamental particles, and you know how the forces are mediated, 
then what you don't know is the relationship between those. Between those, there the are forces. two terms in the relation now. There's a things already tracked by physics, and then there are things that we describe in not, not in the terms of physical theory, not in the terms of those fundamental particles and so on. So there are two relata there. Well, I mean, there's, no, okay, I'm talking so about the, the previous layer. Like, even within physics, one, there is an argument about whether you can have a theory of everything. That's all, totally right. unified. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's another sense. That's okay, right, so right. good. All right, so right. that's another sense. And then we could add in, um, I think, a further sense about what's unknowable by human beings. Right. So, is everything so the aspiration yeah. to a kind of complete true theory of the world, at least in the sense that the physicist is interested, which might be concessive about what doesn't fall inside the theory and what's not reducible to it. And I would just say for the record there that I would plump for... Um, that's where I stop being agnostic, I guess. I think it's a very theological picture of ourselves that we can know everything, and if we really believe we've evolved, and we believe that we have cognitive abilities that are products of evolution, I think it's, it's a small step to say that they're limited. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, And it's a yeah. small step also to say that they're various and that what they deliver might not be integratable into a single unified theory, right? So they, there might be things beyond those capacities and what those capacities deliver might not all um, fit together in a unified theory. I think that's just stepping far back from the details of physics. I think those are just sure. things mm. to bet on. Sure, sure. You right, know. Right, right. Okay. I, so but, so mm. the pretensions of the completeness of physics and have to be specified much more carefully so you don't sound like you're just saying something pretty obviously not true. Um, and the other thing that I would just inject into the conversation is if you want to step back and just say, well, we have physical theory, we have the goals of physical theory, as Tim described them and as you've described them, not as just modeling, but actually purporting to get at fundamental ontology, fundamental laws, fundamental order, and that things in space and time can always fall under the net of physical explanation. I think that's, that's a sense of completeness yeah. of physics. That's consistent with us not knowing everything and consistent with maybe not everything that we think take ourselves to know being integratable into a single theory, unified, reductive, or whatever. Once you get that far with the question of the completeness of physics, then I think, I would just suggest that one good way to proceed is to ask, are there things we haven't yet put on the table that look like they're not promising candidates for um, understanding in physical terms, and that they're so distant from it that right, it starts to look, th then you start to worry about the completeness of well, physics. So, mm -hmm. so the example I would give is first person point of view. Now there are many ways to think about it. There's bodily point of view from, not, from which you perceive and move. There's phenomenological point of view from which it's something it's like, it's like to feel things. And there's also a normative point of view from which you can reason and deliberate. And they're not the same thing at all. But there are questions about whether, um, I mean, I suppose physicists now say that there's something fundamentally perspectival about reality itself, right? Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, I would, I would start by just sort of trying to think about what are the features of things accessible, we're inclined to say, only from a first person point of view. And, and is there a tension between thinking about things under that description, accessible only from a first person point of view, and bringing it under the scope of physical explanation. That's one place where I would push and explore. That, that sounds right to me. I, mean, I think this is compatible, I believe, with the point that Tim and I were working out earlier, which is that you could perhaps give something like a, a physical account of that that wouldn't be an explanation of it, I suppose, or wouldn't be a satisfying explanation of what something is like from a first-person point of view. I would just add to that that there's most of the questions and topics that I think people care deeply about who aren't working on physics probably would fall under that broad domain, which is to say you could give it, you know, they're not outside of the scope of physical reality, um, but they nevertheless can't really be given a, phys a physical explanation. Um, and I would, not, I would add to first-person uh, point of view, most of human culture 
um, that was my example of the arts earlier, but that's just one piece of it. I mean, um, most of human history, most of human culture, most of the kind of questions that people you know, care about and, and are interested in who are not actually working physicists, which is, not, which is maybe to be sort of consensus from the other, right. from the yeah. other side. Yeah. Um, which is to say that there's, you know, physics is obviously very powerful in the ways that, have, uh, that we've been just been told, but it's also, it's, uh, it's the way that it could actually provide knowledge for us about much of what we care about is actually quite limited. And, and there's, I think, probably a, a pretty deep relationship between those limits and its power, if that makes sense. It makes sense, yeah. It's, um, I guess what I've, I, I take that point. What I'm looking for is perhaps an exploration of the features of the first person point of view that are detailed enough right. that, so not like broad things about the kinds of things we care about yeah. and being acculturated and so on and products of history and having lots of purposes besides physical explanation, all of that's mm -hmm. true. But if you just t think of the nature of the first person, that nature threw up first person points of view, so to speak, you know, um, just think about some of their most fundamental features and ask what would it look like to try to tackle that in a physicist spirit. That's what I'm looking right. for. And I'm kind of agnostic, but I have places where I have doubts anyway. So that's what I am inviting. Well, look, I sort of agree with the sentiments that you're expressing, but I still want to stick to the thing is uh, a situation like this, that we are talking about science. Science is something that's very young and just starting. And, the, and it's not just models. It is only models, I would say. Science is only models. You, do, you don't have, there's no way of doing something without presupposing some kind of simplified object which we which you then work with. You don't, uh, if you say the distance from this point to that point is so much, you're, uh, there's no such thing as a point, there's no such thing as this. This is some, some sort of model that you, that you can describe very precisely, and it has some sort of relation to, the, to, to, to what we call, call distance, but it's all models, that's what I say, model. That's, so so my, my first, that's my first, let me just make another little point. So I think science is models. I agree with the uh, other things that the sentiments expressed. I think we're at the beginning of science, but I don't think we can a priori put on limitations and say science will not be able ever to explain such and such. You don't know. It's been, historically, it's been proven that many things that were thought completely unexplainable suddenly became explainable by science. Uh, science is an evol evolving thing. You don't, there's no such thing as, a, as something that's been completely established. You, uh, history is that you, you find a certain model that corresponds to a certain situation, and it's very good if it corresponds to further stuff that you didn't expect. But you can't say that it's not going to be good forever, because history has shown that usually you find something beyond that that the model doesn't apply to, and then you have to change right, the right. model. I mean, the provisionality is sort of a given, but I wanted to um, sort of make two points. The first is that, um, you know, this question in itself, to make it an interdisciplinary one, requires sort of a few rounds of the merry-go-round before we can really get to the question. <laughs> but I think that the, but the key point for me, right, is it's really the nature of reality. So uh, the nature of reality that, um, the complexity of the nature of reality. So for example, I actually um, disagree that you know, the only things we care about are the painting or representation. We care about the physical world. The fact that you can make predictions with physics, we care about that. Sure, yeah. no, sure, of course. That's no, part of the yeah, things yeah, that we, we care about. It's not important. separate. Yeah. It's not separate. The way you were saying it sounded like that's the separate thing other than the light, you know, going back to Tim's right. example, sure. that there's the representation um, of this object or whatever. So I think the first issue is, you know, reality and the descriptors of reality, be they subjective or mathematical descriptors. So let's just collapse all the model mathematics. Let's just make it mathematics, right? So. 
that kind of description of reality, the um, individual person, there is something obviously uh, innately universal within uh, quotation marks, where you know it doesn't matter if I don't like two plus two equals four. It's not a matter of my um, subjective uh, desires or particular uh, perspective on what the sum of two numbers, those two numbers is, right? The, I think to me the, the fact that there is this domain of reality, um, a description that we can all agree upon and demarcating that from the domains that we cannot agree upon because of each individual haptic experience of reality, right? I think, uh, I think introducing the idea of a first person point of view suggests this notion of subjectivity mm. and disagreement, but it isn't what I meant, actually. Okay. I think it's quite possible that, um, that what we think about when we deliberate and ask what it would be best to do mm. is not a matter of what I like, and it might be that um, there aren't, in the end, really truly irresoluble disagreements about that. Uh, it might be that there are real matters of value to investigate and find out about. But um, the point about a deliberative point of view is that you have to ask the question from the first person point of view. What would it be best for me to do, given all that I think? Now, thinking isn't the same thing as thinking from the facts. You have to think right. from what you think. Okay, so that's where the subjectivity comes in. Those thoughts are still answerable to reality, whether they're evaluative thoughts or right. cognitive attitudes, I would say. Can, can I, yeah, Tim's been try, waiting try a while. And make yeah. I'll, I'll try and be very brief. I, yeah. I just want to uh, reframe some of what was said in a, in a way at least I find helpful. Um, so here are some things that I think cannot and never will be reducible to physical truth. Mm -hmm. uh, the big one with respect to first person point of view is consciousness, that's the mind-body problem. I see no prospect of physics ever solving the mind-body problem. I'm agnostic. Problem. We should talk right. about but, that. Uh, I'm just, this is my credo, okay? Uh, what else is there that's not physical truth? I think there's such a thing as mathematical truth that's not physical truth, it's independent of physics. The mathematician may well disagree with me, curiously enough. I think there are ethical and moral truths, some of them, uh, which are not physical truths and are completely unaffected by physics. And that but you they can, don't have to be fixed, right? Or all these I think, that, I think some fixed? of them are fixed. Okay. This is controversial. I'm just laying yeah. it out there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm an objective moral realist. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm a Platonist in mathematics. Uh, and the last little point, just conceptually, just to make sure we don't drift, there are two questions that, that got compressed at a moment. Oh, I'll make one more point after this, which was how much can physics explain and how much can science explain? And my whole right. point was that there's lots of science that isn't physics. Right. And I was talking about the limitations of physics. Those are not the limitations of, of science. science. Right. How far science goes and what in principle can be brought under a scientific method insofar as there is one, is it, in, is it quite a different and, and, and much more and difficult problem? And what's your view problem? on consciousness and, in that? Well, it, I, yeah, could there be a science of consciousness? That's, you know, so you see how these intersect. The last point, I'll just make it very quickly, is just a point of disagreement. I don't believe that, um, that physics or science has to always be models and so on. I think that when Euclid wrote down the rules of Euclidean geometry, he was under the belief that he was describing the physical world. He was describing the thing I'm waving my hands around it, can I finish? And he thought it was accurate and perfectly correct, and he could have been right. It just turns out he wasn't. But he could have been right. And if he was right, then geometry would have been done. Period. And I think physicists well, think that can still happen, and I believe it can still happen. Uh, well, I, I disagree with practically everything you said. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> as, as I would have predicted. Yeah. Predictive accuracy. So let's see. Let's see now. Uh, well, I don't know. I want to go through all of this. But. Um, it seems to me, first of all, that when you have a discussion like this, you can't differentiate between science, what's science, what's physics, what's this. There's something called a scientific method. And that's what we are, I think, talking about. Uh, and uh, it seems to me that scientific method is something that's been, that's been very successful up to a certain point, and we, 
we can hope that it will continue to be more and more successful. And whether we... And it's but in very, practice, it's very, it doesn't really work. Like, what? But in practice, the it's scientific method doesn't quite work in no, a way... No, of and, course... And, and also, as Sue was saying earlier, I mean, uh, uh, coming from outside of philosophy, uh, as I do, uh, yeah. some of the most interesting work in the philosophy of science that I've read has been about establishing relations between physics and the special sciences. I mean, there's interesting questions of reduction uh, 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 okay. uh, 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 and, and there, explanation uh, that are okay. that in there, there, two, I think. Uh, I think there are two questions here. Yeah. There's a question about reductionism inside each specialty. Now, there's yeah. even a very, very big question about reductionism inside mathematics, because mm -hmm. there are various parts of mathematics, uh, how they re re relate, how they are reduced to each other, and in, in physics, and inside, and bio how is biology can be reduced to physics. Those are the in my feeling, those are details. The question, the whole philosophical question, seems to me, is um, uh, how far science uh, can reach to explain things, scientific, the scientific method, which is uh, everything that we call science. And uh, there, it seems to me, uh, you, you cannot, uh, right now, it reaches only a certain extent, a lot, but a little at the same time. It's, uh, Lots of things that we have no idea about, but and even it's true for mathematics too, for that matter. Uh, but then, so beyond that, the question is: Can you say, point to something and say this will never be uh, understood or enlightened to by the scientific method? And I say that's just false. We don't. We we it may be it may be true in that particular case, but you cannot assert that with any certainty that, that, that you'll never <laughs> yeah, no, understand I, I, something. I, I understand that as a kind of faith and I admire it, but I, I think also at the same time that there are dimensions to the world that required really to understand them, ways of interact, ways of uh, investigating them that really are not, that are not scientific or don't follow the scientific course, method. And, that much, and then again, just to, just to follow up on that point, the, um, I think much of what, not all of what we care about, but much of what we care about um, actually would, would fall under that well, kind of description. Uh, that is to say, uh, much uh, of human culture. I, I, I agree with you. Let me give you an example of okay. something which agrees with your, with your point, but uh, illustrates my point also. Yeah. And there is, uh, we, uh, many years ago, I, I was in a very situation where we had a, 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 a person in, in um, South America who, a kid who was taken to a hospital with an infection on his foot, and they decided to to amputate the, the leg. And this uh, uh, person, a uh, 16-year-old kid, ran away from the hospital, went to the mountains to the shaman or something, and they treated him with some, some kind of thing, and his foot was saved. OK? So obviously, um, this sort of points your point that, that in some situations, uh, you should get away from the scientists and, and have people who have experience <laughs> and such and such. But later on, uh, yeah. if you investigate that, it was show, can be shown that the, uh, that the shaman applied something that, that uh, before antibiotics were discovered, it was really had antibiotics with it, boiling the who knows what together. So uh, it seems to me that it's true that at any, any given moment of time, there are lots of things which are not going to be understood from the point of view of science, of scientific reasoning, and you have to rely on experiences and traditions and guesses of all sorts and intuitions, etc. But to say a priori that such and such will never be understood by scientific method, I think, is just, just not reasonable. I think it's a matter of world view, and I think that, and where, and why I call it world view is you can come from a worldview like the one that probably Tim and I share, um, which is of um, epistemic humility, which is why should this gelatinous thing between our ears give us the capability to figure everything out, including itself, okay, right? Well, saying never is not a, not a sign of humility. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, can I? Can I? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Just again, make one, one, one brief, brief, uh, and very controversial uh. intervention here. 
Um, <laughs> you mean as I, opposed to the others? I, I, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go out of character for a minute. I don't think, right. I don't think um, as a philosopher of science, and I think very few, I think the general agreement of all philosophers of science at this point, there is no such thing as the scientific method. That's just a That's myth. Right. Uh, there is no method that all sciences use. And so to say we just have to use the scientific method is, is, is empty. Um, there are certain, there are some good experimental techniques, there's double blinding, there's some things you can guard yourself against that are fairly general, but there's no, you know, take the scientific method and do economics. What does that even mean? It just, there is no, no book of the scientific method. You can look at what particular sciences do and ask for the particular evidence they have and criticize it, but uh, there, there, there just is no such thing. Okay, so I think that there is such a thing as scientific method, and, oh, and it's something. Give, that, give us some it's of it. Something that all of us know and agree with deep inside, if they think about it. The scientific method, basically, is that you observe the world, or observe or think about the world. And in some way, organize ideas about it, and then check it out whether it's true or not. That's basically the scientific well, but method. That, then that, that actually covers at least um, all, of the, all, of the, all of the all of the all of the disciplines. All the disciplines. In which case, I entirely agree with you. I mean, that that that, that you know that that There's nothing scientific, what, uniquely scientific no, about it. It sure. means rigor. It means yeah. you know aiming at truth, um, right. uh, just accounting for the world. Then sure. I mean, that's the same the same for right. you know so my you, department you, of you English depend, literature. The same for the anthropology words, department. And, and, another way of saying but, it. But well, I don't think any of us are going to be physics okay, in the long run. Another way of saying it is that you, you're thinking about things, you're forming a certain model, and then you check it against reality. Okay, so one thing that for sure, according to you, does not follow the scientific method is mathematics. No, no. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we should kick you out no, of the science second. department. Scientific the method. science part of science and humanity. The, the scientific, no, the scientific method is to construct this, this concept, and that's usually done by using mathematics. But, but you don't check mathematics empirically. Yeah, it's you not don't check mathematics in of itself, right? It's uh, no, no, <laughs> well, no, well, sure, no, you, you, have some, you have something called, you have uh, language and mathematics and things, things to communicate with, and that's... Uh, that's uh, no, but it's an internal consistency. The scientists <laughs> and those who understand the science of our time uh, as well as the mathematician here, a question about um, the significance of our mathematical capacities. Since, you know, one of the really exciting things about physics that everybody's been emphasizing is that the world became mathematically tractable in a new and exciting way with the rise of physics. And, and it continues beyond expectations. And it continues beyond expectations. Okay, so, so, um, so that is exciting. I even remember in high school physics, I was uh, in a school where um, it was progressive science, so you actually were supposed to figure out scientific theory, you know, which was silly. But um, anyway, uh, I was taking calculus at the same time that I was doing physics experiments and loading carts with stones and timing their velocity and plotting acceleration. And I got to this point where the graphs I was learning to plot in calculus were identical with the graphs I was plotting about velocity and acceleration, and I got goosebumps. It was like, <gasps> you know, this a priori thing. Um, it's not just a model. It seems like our capacity to work with these a priori concepts was enabling us to mainline uh, features, like very stable features of change in space and time. And that was like an incredibly exciting moment in my 17-year-old life, left an indelible impression. Okay. <laughs> So, but, so, so when I think about the fact that, you know, if, if, if you're not a non-naturalist altogether about, about human beings and human capacities, this capacity to do mathematics, which gave us a capacity to track so many interesting features of things in space and time, um, just looks like it calls for some sort of study, right? So, and I'm sure people have done it, this is not my field, I came to inject stuff about point of view today, which I'm not even doing very much of. Uh, maybe we'll get to it later. But, but, you know, some of the capacities we're born with, I think, arguably, aren't helpful for doing science. So, I think 
personally that our disposition to, to track things in terms of essences, to say, you know, what's the essence of a table? What are its necessary and sufficient pro uh, conditions for being a table is not very useful for science. Biology got rid of it. We no longer look for the essences of species, right? So, but we are all essentialists in, in our cognitive development. We just think in essentialist terms. And I think scientifically we've learned to transcend that capacity. We've learned to transcend the way things look uh, in order to get deeper physical explanations of some of the things we learn by sight. And so there are these questions I have about which of our psychological capacities are our best tools for actually the project of the tracking mind independent reality in, in its most elevated you know, ambition, right, you know, to do that. And so wouldn't, wouldn't it be interesting if there was a physical explanation of an emergence of a capacity to truck in these structures so that you're sort of of what you're tracking in some sense, right? And that to me looks like an, a, a sort of interesting way of completing physics, right? To sort of understand how the, one of the capacities you need to do in mathematics would have interestingly, possibly, some kind of physical explanation because of the way in which the physics of the brain enables these, these funny structures to be constructed mentally, which then are useful for, as you say, modeling or predicting or whatever else, things outside it, right? You know, that just looks like a really exciting domain of study to me. And that's part of psychology, which I wouldn't say is the first person point of view. That's a capacity to, to compute certain things. It's not got to do with the first person point of view. So anyway, so I was just wondering what, like, I'm sure you, we all marvel at how the fact that we can do mathematics seems independent of induction and empirical methods, and yet it drives them when science gets good, right? That's like an interesting and exciting fact. And so what would it be to be open-minded about a way in which physical understanding could complete our understanding of ourselves as having a capacity for mathematics? Um. <laughs> I, 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 I can give a really quick sketch of yeah. something that is in the area of what you just said and is highly speculative. Mm. But, uh, um, the, look, the, the, the Greeks divided mathematics into arithmetic and geometry. And arithmetic, they really meant the theory of whole numbers, as we would say, counting numbers. Those were the only numbers there were. And geometry, the theory of magnitudes, and in particular, what we would call spatial structure. Um, that we have a capacity to think about spatial structure, especially kind of Euclidean mm -hmm. space, is explained perfectly well by evolution on the assumption that we live in a sort of spatial structure, which is pretty nearly, not quite, Euclidean. <laughs> and so to survive, any animal would have to Map. evolve a really efficient map, way to map and think about and predict, because you think any animal that's going to make a decision has to make a prediction. If I do this, this will happen. If I do that, that will happen. Mm -hmm. All of this is modeled in this geometrical arena. Um, so that we can do that well is not so surprising. Visual processing, this is all, again, bringing things into a kind of spatial representation. The, the interesting thing that happened in math was that at a certain point, the arithmetic part that had to do with numbers, what they kept doing was inventing or discovering more and more numbers. So you start with the integers, then you get the rational numbers, then you get the real numbers, then you get the negative numbers, then you get the complex numbers. And then there was this amazing thing of being able to translate between geometry and algebra and, and take geometrical problems and put them in algebraic form and have these powerful ways of solving the algebraic problems and then translating them back into the geometrical language. And, and then geometry itself got pushed into a smaller, smaller corner and everything grew the other way. Uh, all of that, I think, is it, it, it extremely interesting. I mean, that's a kind of magical part, these interconnections among mathematical concepts themselves that you don't think are going to be there, um, that, that turn out to be true, which is just astonishing. But the, our ability, anyway, to think geometrically, I think, has a pretty clear explanation. And, and the basics of counting do, too. Yeah, the basics I'm more of interested in our capacity to think the dot, dot, dot of infinity and to do mathematical induction and um, yeah. other things. Yeah. Well, the, uh, I think 
The way I interpret your question is, is the following, and I think that's the real interpretation, is that, okay, there are all these intuitions that we have about space and so on that comes, as you say, but the real thing that, that makes mathematics mathematics is the fact that you can have rules for deduction, which uh, have been, and that's the great discovery of the Greeks really beyond, beyond geometry, uh, that you, you have a rule, the rules of logic. And that really hasn't been, that's been developed over the centuries and hasn't really been understood completely until Gödel, where he actually has a complete, all these various books that are from Aristotle on that he wrote on these different ways of, um, uh, different logical principles and different reductions and this and all of that can be, uh, has been sort of there's something called the Gettel completeness theorem. He showed exactly the complete system of rules that you can ever use to deduce things. And that, that is, I think, the important thing. How can the human mind have ever gotten to that? It takes two hundreds of years. And uh, th that, I think, is the essence of mathematical reasoning is that you have these, uh, these things of Proofs. You start with certain assumptions, and you have proofs which are sort of incontrovertible. Everybody agrees that it's a proof. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees that this follows from that. And um, that, 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 I think that's a, that's a deep and question, which is which is probably which, which but, uh, physical we, realization of mathematical you know, processes. Is kind you know, of what I'm yeah, which I think is really uh, uh, one of the questions that you uh, would be very hard to. Well, I think you can get some me, insight. Yeah. Maybe you can get some insight by uh, some further understanding of the brain and so on. But but that's a kind of a very hard question. To, I mean, I think for me, uh, still though, um, sorry to keep harping about reality and our capacity to comprehend that reality beyond just sensory comprehension, right? To model it, to abstract it, use mathematics. Yeah. To me, still the most intriguing question, meta question, that, um, you know, for, given what you pointed out, is why the heck is mathematics? Why does it work so well? Not just our capacity to do it, mm -hmm. uh, but in its explanatory power about physical phenomena, what is it about physical phenomena, right? That's why it's so tempting to right. Think so it's that not merely just a language. So you can't just abstract it to the level of language learning, mm -hmm. um, which again, you know, one could easily say, you know, evolutionarily advantageous and so on, right? But beyond that, there's a deeper. To me, it's what's intriguing is there appears to be something deeper than that, right? Which is why it has the explanatory power that it does, right? Right, there is. Is there something deeper about the nature of reality itself that is organized in such a fashion that this is the framework that allows you to access it? And therefore, the kinds of uh, questions, qualia, that you might be interested in that this framework is not automatically adaptable to, mathematical framework, they don't give you the same glimpse of reality, right? So I, I think that's know. one way to yeah. frame. Well, uh, I make an observation that is quite right, but it also sort of goes the other way around because in many ways, mathematics comes out of physics. Like, for example, uh, but not, not only from the, uh, you started doing these things by these measurements and so on, but almost anything, like for example, a very powerful thing that was uh, in the 19th century, uh, there was something called, uh, that was discovered called the Dirichlet principle, mm -hmm. which uh, basically it means that <clears throat> that you can uh, do a certain way of uh, proving existence of of things by. Oh, never mind. I was yeah. uh, anyway. So there's this principle, and then amazingly enough, Riemann used this to prove all sorts of mathematical theorems uh, which are in geometry, which are very powerful in, in uh, topology. And then came Weierstrass and said, this principle doesn't work. And gave examples where the principle doesn't work. 
Then there, was, then there was a period of about 50 years where people tried to figure out what, what's really going on there and found out exactly under what circumstances that principle works. And that developed the theory of partial differential equations and, and also Riemann's work applied to uh, flows, mm -hmm. to analysis of liquid flows. So there's a kind of complete, uh, you know, something may, some idea may come from physics, then it gets yeah, I'm criticized. Not as, uh, I mean, I'm so. not as intrigued about the causative uh, no. connections. I mean, it, right. it, yes, sometimes this, you know, things it comes can come back and out forth, of whatever. Sort of. But to me still, the no, question but is... Mystery, so but that mystery, that, mm. that, sorry, you want to talk about So if I understand your question correctly, Priya, why mm -hmm. is it that reality, physical reality, seems to be so uniquely... Uh, explainable by or fit with mathematical rules formula, and that um, as um, just that's. I'd like to hear more about that. That sounds fascinating to me. I, this is not nothing I know anything about, except for that it seems to um, be in some potential interesting again tension with um, what Carol was describing earlier as our moving away from essences, since you're talking about things are somehow kind of boiling down to form or order, perhaps a term that you used earlier. So there's something intrinsically orderable about the physical world that seems to fit up with the formal order of mathematics. And so the kinds of things that might be of interest to us yeah. that don't fit that rubric yeah. of mathematics might be what limit those points of view from being mm -hmm. encompassed into physics sure. and a description of reality. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I'm gonna again, I'm sorry. I'm gonna make a kind of weird thing here because I feel like Jonathan's been sitting here very patiently, um, and and something went by quickly, and then I just want to come back and ask sure. you about this. So there was the idea that the essence of scientific method is that in science you come up with a theory, it makes some empirical predictions, you go and check. And the, the world can push back right, mm -hmm. on, on your theory because mm -hmm. the empirical predictions can just turn out to be wrong. And then, sure. you know, and th this is certainly part of the understanding of why physics is, at a certain point, was so successful because they got lots of data that would push back. Um, and you said, well, then that's sort of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious about how far you think that goes. I mean, I, you, certainly a historian, right? Um, right. The world can push back. A literary theorist. Do yeah. you think the world can push back? Sure, of course. So, can you just yeah? No, the world can push back insofar as that the the corner of the world that literary theorists or literary scholars or or those who work in uh, in that section of the humanities are concerned with is the world of texts or artworks. They push back all the time. In some ways, I think actually, uh, my section of the humanities is uh, is perhaps you know the most empirical corner of the of the academy. Insofar as we are constantly trying to make our interpretations or explanations of our phenomena adequate to what to to the material that we're engaging, texts, artworks, what have you. So um, so they push back in the sense that um, um, uh, something seems wrong about what we are saying or attempting to describe. So, or so let me just sure be sure I understand. Because it's, it's not my understanding, and I would be curious to know. So there, there are literary theories. I don't know them mm -hmm. well. I'm way out of my depth. Here. Sure. But at some point, deconstruction was a sure, big sure, deal. Sure, Derrida sure. was a big yeah. deal. Yeah. It, it, is it that you could go into a library and find in a dusty corner a text and open it and say, hey, Derrida was wrong. Look, right. this text is incompatible right, with... Yeah. whatever it was he was doing. Can we kill off literary crazes, theoretical crazes, uh, yeah. empirically like that? Or no, probably it wouldn't, it wouldn't work exactly Indeed. like that, but yeah. I think it would be more along the lines of um, certain schools of thought in that guided interpretation seemed like they were, over time, less compelling or convincing with what they had to say about the world that we were endeavoring to explain. There may be dimensions to them that actually one wants to hold on to. Um, but, uh, but I think that, I think that actually literary, pra literary critical practice was n on the ground very rarely taking like a set of ideas from, uh, from a theorist or a philosopher like Derrida and then just using it to just like smush whatever we were engaging. 
Mm -hmm. um, at least not when it was done well. No, but isn't the kind of the notion of validation yeah. that we have in yeah. science is fundamentally different? From of course. Well, it depends. Yes, in the sense of prediction, for example. Yeah. yeah. No. In the, the interpretive. So there is no. I mean, there is no expectation that a literary theory could be proved or disproved by sure. going into a library and opening up a book. Yes. Right? No. Right. Exactly. Nor Unlike is there any expectation. Unlike in physics, where right. you go to South Africa and you perform yes. the same experiment and you don't get the same result. Right. And you go to India and you, do, you don't, then it's uh, not valid. Yeah, right. no, I think that would be, and again, I think this probably is the case for most of, not just the literary humanities, but most of the, most parts of the, uh, most of the rest of the humanities and also the humanistic social sciences, anthropology, parts mm -hmm. of sociology as well, um, which is that, you know, things tend much less to be sort of conclusively proven or disproven. Um, than uh, to yield interesting or adequate explanations of the phenomena. Um, and, and, so and do you think, is it, is it about closure, that there is no completeness? I think it's, about, it's a partly about closure, it's partly about keeping questions open. I think it's also probably about expecting there to be less um, uh, progress, in the sense of like, you know, aiming over time slowly to some but sort I of... I wonder if that part. is not just a different lens to view provisionality in science. It very well could be. No, right. actually, I mean, because I, I think that there are lots of ways in which um, there are, say, you know, all the disciplines are aiming at truth um, and are aiming to, for, um, you know, with, with disciplinary humility to um, provide an account of the phenomena that they engage. Um, and to do so within norms that are established within a disciplinary framework um, and that are in some ways driven by something like consensus. Um, yes, I, want to, you, I wanted you to pitch in and, now. No, I just wanted to ask a follow-up sure. about the difference between uh, what I would think of as critical disciplines, right, like yeah. literary studies and literature itself, oh, sure. or truth in, truth in art, truth yeah. in fiction, mm -hmm. and so yeah. on. Yeah. And so I, I don't know, I guess my working view truth, is that, right? my working view is that, yeah, you can learn things from art, you know, there's mm -hmm. truth there. And, Absolutely. And, but I might, the problem might be that I'm a bit of a pragmatist, and pragmatists are quite comfortable with the idea that you've got a truth so long as it helped you f solve a problem or figure something yeah. out, and it was useful, right? Yeah. And um, Henry James famously yeah. said in The Art yeah. of Fiction that uh, fiction is true when you can use it to ride one bit of your experience to another. Right. And that sounded just like his brother, William. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I just was wondering, because I would think that a critical discipline might not have that same empirical burden that Tim was asking about as art itself. Was my follow-up oh, question? I thought you, I thought you, were you see that a critical direction. discipline yeah, could a yeah, critical yeah. discipline right. could be right. could be aimed at um, all kinds of things besides that. I think, whereas the art itself, maybe not. Oh yeah. Again, I thought um, I thought you were going to go in the other direction. I know most people art, would expect. That. Yeah, because you say art is interested in all other things besides truth. It is interested, perhaps, just in beauty or in uh, or in some other more mm. subjective experience on the part of a reader or a beholder and that's what makes artworks valuable and interesting and why one tends to go to to want to read them or to view them or whatever which is you know you're not necessarily interested in truth you're interested in say the experience of beauty or some version of the sublime or something like that um, but i agree with you in there that i think actually uh, the aesthetic domain um, is a domain that can produce certain kinds of truth that can tell you things about, that we care deeply about, about our world and about our culture Lord and about ourselves. Deep. Sure. Um, uh, but though I think most, again, I mean, this, maybe this also is a sort of version of pragmatism too, which is I think like most of the time we are living in a world with what we care about is lowercase truths rather than uh, uppercase truths. Um, although I think that also the two are fundamentally compatible. Um, but I, but I think, um, on the other hand, to take the other example, the critical disciplines, that is to say, the, uh, the humanities, um, like perhaps leaving philosophy out of it for a moment, and the humanistic, humanistic social sciences, um, I think are truth-oriented disciplines. I mean, in the sense that they, you know, they have internal standards, they have norms, um, they, they, uh, in the interpretive work that they, that they 
um, try to do is subject to these norms, and they try to provide an account of the phenomena that is true, accurate, compelling, um, but often quite, you know, limited and hedged. I mean, in the sense of like, you know, aiming for a, to answer a particular set of questions. Um, about a range of texts or other kinds of cultural phenomena that you are in the business of interpreting. Thank you. I <laughs> wanted to go back to something Tim said. I don't know if I totally understood. You said we will never understand in scientific term consciousness. In yes. physical terms. In physical yes. terms. I said in physical yeah, terms. In physical, physical terms. terms. Yeah. Why not? Because. Ultimately, I think it's, uh, it, this, this would be an entire panel right. on its own. I'll try and say it briefly. Ultimately, physics is the theory of matter in motion. That's sort of a way you can, and that's why I said it has, you know, it, it, everything, uh, an economic, you know, the, the, the depression was certainly matter in motion, right? There were these bodies falling out of buildings. Um, so it, physics had to cover that. Uh, any phenomenon that you see, at least in some part, is matter in motion, roughly, physics is going to have to handle. The idea that my pain, feeling pain, the experience of pain, that fundamentally first-person subjective ouchiness, um, could be a matter of being explained in terms of matter in motion it, the, the, the explanatory gap there, I don't see how it could in principle so if be hypothetically, be, I don't know if this is, I, uh, uh, this is not a scientific assertion. Yeah. Hypothetically, if uh, I brought your thyroid hormones down, mm -hmm. you will start feeling sad. Mm -hmm. Then you'll start out of feeling down and eventually very depressed. Yes. And everything that you're experiencing would look bleak. Yes. Then I put you back on thyroid hormones and you suddenly are feeling fine. Yes. So that's a physical yes. explanation of what happens to your emotions by virtue of this chemical reaction. It, it, so my, my conscious states clearly are intimately connected to my physical state. Right. And so I can predict, like pain, I said, there, I can make perfectly good predictions if I drop a bowling ball on your toe, which is a physical state, that you're going to go into a state of extreme pain, assuming everything is, is, is normal. <laughs> um, that is not a physical explanation of pain itself. Maybe the, the simple way I can do it is say this. If I tell somebody, program a computer so it plays a really fine game of chess, that's a hard thing to do, but you pretty much have an idea what you're going about to do it and how to approach it. If I say, good, now program the computer so it can carry on an apparently normal human conversation, people can do that, they have done it, and so on. Now I say, okay, here's your computer. Now program it so that when I hit the F key, it hurts, right? The computer feels pain in the same, same way we do. That is, that it would be morally unacceptable to hit the F key, okay? It would be, you would be torturing an actual sentient object when you hit the F key. Program your computer to do that, and any computer scientist is gonna say, I haven't got a clue. But it doesn't have to be programmable into a computer to be physical. No, I'm just and making it, a and, point. And, you but, just but, ask but, yourself what the resources this, are to be able were, to do that. But that's a, yeah, that's well, a question. No, but I think that's obvious. But, but isn't there an answer to that? I mean, I, I agree with you, actually, I think, on, on the point that you're making. But couldn't, for that particular example, couldn't you imagine some future of some, some you know, many, many years from now, some advanced computer scientists, some advanced computer science where someone could actually make that program, figure out precisely what's happening, you know, or, or build a brain. So, like, you know, I've, we've they've mapped the neural car correlates of pain perfectly so that I can actually create a brain that would experience pain if I, you know, sure. banged it in a certain way. But even then, actually, you could also imagine the same brain not experiencing pain. There's no that you don't understand the relationship between the structure and the experience right. itself. That's the point. That's, That's the, the point. point. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, right. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I mean, there's, uh, obviously, this is extremely speculative. I mean, why uh, we've just started uh, 
a little bit about understanding a little bit about medicine and about things like that. Why, why I don't see why it, why it follows that you, you can say you take never. I stab at maybe giving an I mean, example I mean, I mean, uh, that might explain this point of view. I mean, there, there might be. I just think that there, for example, there isn't going to be a particular formula for anger, which is all the neurons that all the neurons that have to fire and all the calcium levels that have to be at whatever, whatever, in order to define anger. Right. And that whatever, suppose even, first of all, there's stochasticity in all those pathways, right? right. I think the point is that if those neurons fire just in the same way, for her and for me, the result may not be anger for both of us. Well, it might be it? experientially. Well, so it's it that is. mapping that we... Oh, yeah, but guess, why not be open-minded? What if it yeah. is? Yeah. But, but if it is, I guess, yeah. this is the, the, again, like, w even if it is, understanding what or why, why this particular pathway produces the subjective experience of anger is right. still, a, yeah, that's still an unanswered question. Sure. And that's the explanatory gap, and that's what you're saying is in principle right. unresolvable. Right. And that's actually, right. my own intuitions are, would well, run in the same direction. So, so what you are saying is, uh, if I have an explanation, uh, if I say this particular pathway re leads to my big toe moving, yeah. Yeah. that's different than if I say this explanatory pathway leads to anxiety. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or leads to the subjective yeah. experience. Subjective experience yeah, the of anxiety. Subjective anxiety. experience, because the yeah. there is some other. Yeah. Filter but, of but, personal point of view. Yeah. But since subjective experience is connected to the same neural pathways, yeah. I don't know why you would make a distinct, why you would separate them. The problem is privacy. But you see, I don't think, I think that it's overblown why privacy is unincorporatable in physics. This is one of the things that I was hoping we would get to. Obviously, you know your you own define feelings. privacy? Okay, so you only know these things from your own case what it actually feels like. You mean privileged like. access. Basically. Yeah, privileged yeah. access. Yeah. Okay. Privileged access isn't only privileged access, it's exclusive access. access. Okay. And exclusive access is privacy. So, you know, philosophers talk about the mind-body problem and the problem of other minds, and they like to start with these qualitative dimensions of consciousness where there's something it's like to see red, something it's like to feel pain, and if you don't have color vision and you don't have the right kinds of sensitivities, you will never know because you've never had the experience in your own case. So that's privacy. And, and it feels, and there's a good case to be made that that's a kind of quintessential example of subjectivity, though I'm, I don't think it's the most central and important one. I think it's way overblown. Um, but the idea that there's something it's like has emerged in nature. It has, for some creatures. And we have pretty strong evidence that it requires a working brain and working neural circuitry and certain sensitivities. There are deficits when those things are not there. And it is mysterious why there's this inner qualitative dimension to life. It's true. But it doesn't seem to me like it's not a good thing to study scientifically. I, I'm just. You know, I can only, for instance, as going back to the big toe, there's a problem of other bodies. I can only control my body, I can't control your body, right? It's just what it is to be the single organism that you are. You have bodily boundaries, you have motor control within that body, and you also have a kind of sentient access to things going on within it, which you're locked into because you're a separate organism, and you have a, a self-contained nervous system. But that it's a hard problem of consciousness that physics couldn't ever take on strikes me as, I mean, these events do occur in time. It looks like they occur kind of in space because they're located inside people who are spatially located. So they look like they fall under, like when you said there's no event that happens that a physicist shouldn't be able to take on and think about, I would think these would then be among them. And, and oddly, I don't really think that the features of the first person point of view that uh, might resist physical treatment include the qualitative dimensions of consciousness. I think they're more likely to be tractable physically than dimensions of value. Personally, I think. <laughs> well, yes, that's another layer. Yeah, that's <laughs> Just to put I, another I, thing out yeah, there. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, I think value and normative truth 
mm. is, is is separate and untouchable by physics. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I said that. So yeah, I agree exactly. With her. Yeah, I know. But the, but, 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 but consciousness there is, no is problem. not. Yeah. I mean, just I just just mm. a point. There's no problem at all understanding physically why I can control my body and not exactly. Critics. Right. Sure. So that's trivial. Right. But this is a a, a problem that and w when you sort of imagine. Proto physics. Imagine I'm a Democritus, and all I believe there's this empty space, these atoms that float around, they bang into each other, and they have mm. little hooks and eyes. And, and then you say, in principle, can such a theory explain nutrition, right? Why an animal can eat things and grow? And you say, well, sure, in principle, you could imagine these kinds of shaped atoms get taken in and they hook up to these that are in the animal and it grows out. That's not an actual theory, but it's, you see clearly how. The resources are there, in principle. To make and, connections. And to, to, yeah. to, and to explain sure. the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. Right. It's the, the, the problem of consciousness is that you just don't see in principle, which is not to say you can't get all kinds of correlations that you could right. make, even predictions, that you could bring it under a certain kind of scientific discipline, but that there's an explanatory and aspects of it, sure, and explore sure, potential absolutely. aspects of right. it. Okay, absolutely. well, I guess, but that, completely explain it. Okay, that's the question. What is an explanation? Yes, then? yes. Because yes. inductive correlations do darn well for Newton and a lot of things, right? When he doesn't have deep ultimate explanations of a lot of things, right. he just found out some basic laws. Right. You know, so you know maybe those things can be found here. All right, we'll stop and open for questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was uh, struck by the absence of a discussion. Um, well, let me start over. So there's been there's sort of like an intuitive argument here and a back and forth among the panelists about whether certain explanations will ever be a, a, available, like with enough time. Like why why not be agnostic about it? Maybe we will ultimately have an explanation. Um, it would be interesting to, th I thought it would be interesting to consider the idea of like al algorithmic complexity. That is, how long, an how much of an explanation is required to give a relevant explanation? That's a little bit of what I think Tim touched on a little bit when you talked about the computer person and the physicist describing how long a certain computer program will run. Uh, I think it's interesting too that relevance ties into perspective. I think. So, so the idea would be if you have an explanation, even in mathematics, you have an explanation that runs 300 pages, and someone's able to condense it to two pages. We normally say, well, that two-page one gives the explanation. No, we say and it's a more beautiful explanation. Well, we bring well, aesthetics well, into it. Well, no, normally people say it at the same time, but it also provides more of our understanding is increased by the shorter explanation, not the very, very long. Depends on, what those yeah, two, exactly. well, on, the, on those two okay, pages. Okay, I suppose so, but the idea is just to support yeah. Mm. Just to support your view. No, I'm just I, kidding. Yeah. I, no, I'm just kidding. I, if, I object to everything. Yeah, okay, Don't worry. Right. So even if, even very, very, if, the, if one explanation is extremely long and the other is shorter and it's more relevant to what you're, what you're trying to explain, mm -hmm. then you could so argue that the long, long reason. explanation is really irrelevant or doesn't really provide much of an explanation. Mm -hmm. It's as long in terms of complexity as the very problem you're trying to explain. Sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, we, the, the notion of explanation has been floating yeah. through the conversation and never become the target. Right. <laughs> and it's a really, really complicated and difficult thing. Um, and I can't say anything brief. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll just make a couple points, which is we've talked a lot about science wanting to provide explanations and that being part of the aim of science and that even being an indication of truth. Those things can come way apart. Um, for example, and, and now I can um, really be offensive here, one of the things that bothered Popper when he was worried about the nature of science, um, the things that he, that claimed to be scientific that he rejected were, one of them was Marxism, and one of them was Freudianism. And his objection to Freudianism as it were, it wasn't that it was incapable, well, you put it a funny way, it wasn't that it was incapable of explaining anything, it was that it was capable, it was capable of explaining literally anything. That any human behavior, you could come up with some Freudian story that had the hallmarks of being explainy, 
Um, but exactly because it was completely unconstrained by the behavior, it meant you were just telling a just so story. There's no reason to think any of it was true. So the first, what an explanation is, and the relation between explanation and truth and explanation and evidence of truth, these are very, very, very difficult. So, the, so the challenge that people who believe that there could be a complete physical theory for everything is to explain how you would get to condensing uh, an overlong and overly high, too high a dimensional And how would you know you have a valid theory of everything? Right. But that's the challenge, I think, that, that, that I can make a, to be a real quick comment on about brevity and the completeness of physics. So many physicists who believe there should be an ultimate physical theory, which I believe, they often say, and, and one of the indications you've gotten it is that there's an equation you can write on a t-shirt, right? There's the t-shirt standard. You can't get much briefer than that, okay? <laughs> this equation, in principle, explains everything. Now, to actually work out any particular one of those explanations, like why does the water bottle do that, from that equation could take billions of pages to work out of the mathematics. And you'd say that's, that's irrelevant as long as it follows deductively, and this comes back mm -hmm. to as long as it follows from that equation, that's, well, that could be the correct physics. Well, well, okay. Thank you. Just to make a remark about equations, Mm -hmm. uh, somebody, uh, some, somebody, and I forget who, made the observation that all of mathematics can be described by the equation A equals zero. Just have to <laughs> specify what A is. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so sh uh, brief explanations have something um, <laughs> uh, funny about them. But uh, I want to throw out a, a, an sort of an example of an explanation which I think is interesting. And that is that uh, von Neumann in the 30s, or in later in the 40s maybe even, uh, developed a very um, interesting theory about how to design, uh, what would be required for a computer to be able to reproduce itself. And he sort of, you know, mathematically sort of axiomatized what would be what what's the right conditions are, and then he found then he found four elements. I've written down here, but I think I know better not. Uh, but uh, roughly, he found four things that a computer will have to have in order to reproduce itself. Four kind of things, and then if you have them, you can theoretically design a computer that does. Okay, uh, then ten years later or something. DNA was discovered and so on. And it turns out that we've exactly found, they found exactly those things in nature, which, uh, which sort of explain, in quotes, uh, reproduction. So, uh, I, I mean, I. More goosebumps. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that we're at the beginning of a, some sort of adventure here, and it's very hard to put down uh, limits a priori. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you for very stimulating conversation, and I have a lot of questions, but probably can ask only one. And I would like to ask about this um, mythology of mathematics success. Because let's talk, for example, let's calculate my movements, and I will be moving only mathematically, I would not be able to move even one step. You see, but my body calculated without my conscious uh, awareness, and I could do whatever I want. And, uh, and this followed to the question that evolution created us during million years with very intricate and very slight progression. And our successful science, mostly successful in destructive creation, when we remove everything that was created during millions of evolution and pr proliferate ourselves, like 
Remove everything and build a pyramid, or build a nuclear bomb, or build something that distract, destroy everything that we could move and make something convenient only to us, which is actually working against us, like we, with, uh, for example, mitigation. We remove all our microbiome, we remove everything, and it's, we create um, uh, um, destructive bacteria who, uh, who actually, um, in these situations, um, that established on our success in science, actually create situations that are very destructive even for us. What is the question? Question is uh, is the uh, is our science more destructive or more creative? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not an either or. If we, if I mean, we, if we uh, have a, a atomic uh, or hydrogen bomb warfare within the next hundred years, then uh, it's more destructive. But if we continue to uh, make people. Well, if you have tap well, fusion and solve the problem what? of uh, energy for or, the whole world. Yeah, well, carbon, yeah. I mean, uh, but not just nuclear destruction. I mean, carbon, yeah. carbon extraction, I mean, is, is going to do much more. I the new danger was artificial intelligence, not atomic bombs. Right, right. So that uh, <laughs> science, uh, science can be used <laughs> in either, either yeah, for good or for bad. And yeah. it is used for both. So the question is, which, what is it used right, more for, it, right, good right. or bad? Science is, a t I mean, this comes back to values and so on. Yeah. Science is a kind of tool, mm -hmm. uh, and right. it's like asking, are hammers more destructive or constructive? It depends on what people use them for, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's not, the, the, the hammer is not responsible <laughs> for the hammer user. Um, hope well-constructed science gives us true a a accurate predictive abilities and therefore tends to really? expand our technological abilities. But how we use that and whether we're wise oh. enough to see that there will be unintended and unforeseen consequences and also that we're kind of idiots no, but and I we think make mistakes also, all know, the time, is that's on to us. To answer, um, <laughs> I think some of what she was asking is that perhaps you know we as human beings um, have focused too selfishly just on ourselves and the impact of the science and technologies that we create on ourselves. And that we need to have the ecosystem, the larger world, and impact on the planet, and all of that um, be part of the playground in which we do the evaluation of um, our technology, for example. Right. OK, let's go, and yeah. then we go to well, the question. Uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, there's one unfortunate thing. Uh, I mean, I agree with everything everybody said, more or less. But uh, there's one unfortunate thing. That unfortunately, I mean, a person may make a hammer in order to, for good purposes. But there are things that people make, like the atomic bomb, which are done presumably for a good purpose of defense of the nation or something. And wh when they do that, Unfortunately, they have two things. They produce this horrible possibility, but as a byproduct of these kind of investigations, all sorts of things that are good can come out. And unfortunately, a lot of very powerful and good science has come out from research on, on war-like things, like the internet, for example which may be good or bad, I don't know, it could be very good, but, uh, <laughs> but it has come, it, it's come by, uh, from well, and, and, and also a lot of the technological, I mean, like, you know, being able to fly, um, you know, across the Atlantic in, in five hours to, uh, you know, to go to a conference in London is a fine thing for, you know, uh, for, for advanced Western democracies to have. At the same time, that's actually destroying the planet. So, I mean, the. Right. Um, but if we thought of the whole planet, yes, exactly. As if we, every human being, felt stewardship for the whole planet, yes. then, yeah. you know. It's a yes, exactly. Thing. I yeah. agree entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back to uh, the issue of reductionism, I think that was the mm -hmm. real subject. Um, <laughs> I think the leap from physics to consciousness is a huge leap and maybe too hard for us to, to bridge here. But let's just take very small leaps. So, for example, in biology, you have concept of gene. Okay? It's a purely biological object, or you have DNA, for example. Can you ever, ever explain or 
uh, derive the concept of a gene from physical principles? I think that's really one of the fundamental questions. Let me even go into a sub-level. Within physics, you have the fundamental laws of physics, and then you have thermodynamics, or the, or the second, law of thermo, uh, second law of thermodynamics. You have to introduce new principles in order to get a symmetry in time, because the fundamental laws are symmetric in time. So even within physics, you have levels that are very hard to bridge those levels. And, I, and uh, so the question is, can you really, really, ex in an explanatory way, bridge these levels in any way, as long as the constructs are different? Can you ever, can you ever develop constructs in one level that are emerged from constructs at a, mm -hmm. a, a level that's lower? Yeah. Um, is that, I mean, Ask. should I Answer. Try, yeah. try and answer? Look, the, the gene is a perfect example. Um, Mendel was looking at his peas and seeing how they grew, and uh, he knew that characteristics were passed on from the parents to the offspring, but he didn't know how. He had no idea of what the physical basis of that was. But he could, do, he could have a really good theory by just saying, well, let's assume that there are some things, I'll call it a gene, um, one comes from each parent and there's this dominant and recessive and there's uh, independent assortment and so on. And I can make then predictions about if I cross a true breeding smooth pea with a true breeding you know, other pea and then they'll all do this and they'll all do that, makes these predictions are absolutely right. Can physics ultimately explain that? Sure. It's just a matter of finding a physical system that does what the gene is postulated to do functionally. And we did it. Yeah, finding and, a and model. so there's no explanatory gap there at all. I mean, what the physics will tell you is the limitations on the model. So you can say Mendel's model was very simple-minded. And if you look deep into the physics, you'll find that this very simple mathematics isn't going to work in detail because the genes just don't are more complicated and their interactions are more complicated. But I think that's a very clean case of a physical explanation, giving the physical underpinning of yeah. something that, that, that uh, was explained. Okay, go ahead. Well, this is a little bit of a variation since I'm in the arts. And uh, I heard you speaking about ideas of ultimate truth and beauty. And today in the arts, that doesn't seem the primary goal at all. It seems almost the opposite. Uh, the goal in the arts today seem to be, I'm also talking particularly maybe the visual arts, multiplicity, um, communications, um, variability, mutability, um, boundary, lack of boundaries, porousness, um, com strange combinations of things that haven't existed before. But I wouldn't speak of it as a search for truth or beauty. It seems more uh, a different kind of search. I don't want to give a word for it. I mean, I sort of like to leave it open and not give it a category. But um, actually, this seems to be in search, really, of the mystery and the unknowable rather than the finding of the knowable, that what, what seems to be attracting is the elusiveness of things. I'm not speaking about all the branches of, that have come out of the art, and the arts have gotten into all kinds of hybrid combinations, but I don't think youth or trudy, uh, truth is, is part of the vocabulary anymore of this particular search, and I just wondered what you think about that in terms of um, the search in science and the search in the arts. Um, well, I think, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with much of the way that you characterize the sort of um, the rationale for uh, the contemporary art world. Um, I think I would only add to that that um, a lot of the language you use, mutability, um, boundary crossing and blurring, are subspecies of a certain kind of beauty. Um, and that, um, to use the, uh, a term from the great Russian literary critic Viktor Shlovsky from the early 20th century, what the artworks are trying to do there is to defamiliarize our experience, um, to show us dimensions to the, uh, to the world by taking them out of our common perceptions and common interactions with the world. Um, and there, I think actually much is learned in that process about, um, about the world that we live in um, and, um, and about ourselves. Um, 
I think that it's just not a mimetic truth. That is to say, the artworks are not representing the world. They're not holding a mirror up to it. They are in some ways defamiliarizing the world. Um, uh, and doing that in virtue of their form, the particular kind of shape that they have, um, and the certain devices that they use. Um, I, for me at least, that's, a, that's compatible with, with understanding that what, what works of art are, um, are often beautiful, um, or the sublime, to go back to you know, categories of aesthetic theory that developed in my own period, which is the 18th century, which I think do a pretty good but not complete job of accounting for the aesthetic domain. But I was curious whether you had, there was a political dimension no, to your I question think, at no, all, because not. I think what is being contested now uh, for the last, I guess, 30 years or so in all forms of art um, is also who gets to define truth and beauty. Sure. And is there a single who standard for them? Who all gets to which cultures, which genders, sure. who, um, whose lenses define truth and beauty? And that is rupturing everywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, yes. So I wondered if you were asking that more political no, side of the question. No, if that's one aspect. No, yeah. I'm speaking about all, the idea of ultimate questions. And I, you know, that's a more sociological and that's something happening out of our history. I'm talking about maybe... No, but even in the, in the creation of artworks, right? I mean, of... It's one branch. Yeah, I wouldn't right. call it un, the, you know, a total branch of what's really occurring. And I think communication, I would say communication instead of truth, because truth in the arts very often is a, is a very difficult, very difficult phenomena. Mm -hmm. And um, beauty is also a very difficult word. I find it a very difficult word. But I mean, isn't it just because they are such subjective notions, very different from the kind of truth and beauty we're talking about in science, like the 20 page proof versus the three line proof? There's, a, there's an agreement that we can get at. There's a process to reach agreement. I'm not saying that you can't agree that, you know, you, we can't agree that Caravaggio was an amazing artist. I mean, they, obviously. But the question is, there's a process by which you arrive at what is truth and beauty? Has that been disrupted? I'm just offering a suggestion. Do you reckon that's what's happened? Uh. I'm just curious, curious also yeah. about the nature of your resistance. I mean, the, the, um, that is like what's motivating the question. There seems to be, I mean, uh, something about, and I agree with you that the overt language of beauty might have somewhat retreated, um, but I still think actually there's a tacit understanding of it insofar as artworks um, demand a certain kind of valuation, and they're a domain of value, um, which, you know, uh, has to have some substance to it, some accounting for it. Well, I was um, thinking well, of the word communication, which you, if you want to find communication beautiful. Well, uh, but then, I if mean, I want communication, I can also just like, you know, I, I can just read the newspaper. No, um, no, well, there's all so levels. Well, well, there are existential what, communications well, Sure, but too. then what, what distinguishes yeah. an act of aesthetic communication from an act just of like ordinary communication? And I would say that it's something having to do with its form and something to do with the way in which the form defamiliarizes the kind of the, the, the dimension to the world that it's trying to eliminate. Once you go that far, I think actually recognizing that what we're talking about falls underneath some broad conception of the beautiful is actually a pretty easy step to take. But, if, uh, but, the, but I find your resistance to that interesting. Well, I think a lot of words are overused over the centuries. And what's happened to them is they no longer seem to have a certain potency. And I think we have to, we have to renew many things and maybe vocabulary has to be thought of too because vocabulary had, there are traditional thoughts about beauty, traditional thoughts about truth. Maybe then we have to find out how we're going to redefine uh, these, these questions because it, it doesn't relate to the kind of beauty we thought of. Um, so it gets back to many of the questions. Many of the topics are pretty about. Okay. Yeah. Can I um, make a so make a final uh, comment and then? Yeah, a, a very um, deflating comment here. I, I don't think art tries to do anything. I don't think that actually is what we call in philosophy a category mistake. Art is incapable of attempting or intending or trying to do anything. Artists are. And individual artists, I think, have many, many, many different, entirely diverse <laughs> aims. Some of them are trying to make a political point. Some of them are trying to make a good buck. Some of them are doing their art for their own sake entirely and don't care whether anybody sees it. Some are trying to communicate something. Some are, have, have read some science and say, this is true. I want to 
depict this truth. Some are saying, I want to imagine something that nobody ever thought of. I don't but really see some... that there's anything very useful about asking what is art for. I think it's useful to understand what was this artist trying to do and appreciate but the, that? But the, only, but the only way, Tim, that you can answer that question is to actually look at the works of art. I mean, that's the... Uh, you can and you ask can, the artist? No, but the, you can ask the artist and you'll get almost, almost always the wrong answer. Well, I just want to really correct one thing. Yeah. Yeah. In, no, <laughs> in no way was I not, of course yeah. there's multiplicity of view, and of course that's the wonderful thing about art. We have all this multiple different psyches that are all mm -hmm. investigating things. Um, and I was just speaking about, when one was speaking of truth and beauty, it made me, jolted me a little, because I thought, hmm, my God, that's a word that, you know, will have to be... You know, it's, it's, it just doesn't hold the power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.